Hello everyone, so welcome back to another Think Like a Medical Registrar video. In this series, I am going to talk through scenarios, concepts, ideas, perspectives, which will prepare you for your paces, but also your real life as a medical registrar. Okay, so my name is Vishal Kumar. I'm the founder of this channel and also KeenMedic.com. Today we are talking about Dave's dysphagia. Okay, so in this video, we are going to be covering, first of all, the scenario which Dave presents in. We're then going to proceed to your plan. Okay, so I need you to tell me your plan, what your differential diagnosis is, uh, before we move forward after the scenario. And then we'll talk about some key considerations followed by the scenario review itself, along with the diagnosis that this video covers. And then we're going to move on to Bite Size Bundle, which uh, will be very useful for your PACES exam or any other MRCP exams and also for your real life. So, so stay until the end if you want to benefit from that. OK, and also if you see this icon, the bell icon, make sure you pause the video and basically follow the instructions of what I'm asking you to do to gain the most out of this video. OK, let's get started. So the scenario is here. We have Dave, who is a 56-year-old office worker who has been referred by his GP to your general medical clinic due to dysphagia. He is fit and well otherwise, smokes approximately 30 a day and drinks socially with his friends on the weekends. And he's never taken any drugs. OK, so other than the fact that he's got dysphagia uh, and he smokes, we don't really have much else. So let's see. What do we have? This is the second appointment. In the last appointment, you found out that the dysphagia has been ongoing for about three to four months. OK, the food feels like it gets stuck, but there is no real choking or coughing as such. All right. And he may have had some unintentional weight loss as well, but he can't be sure. All right. So we've got a bit more information here now. Let's see. Investigations we've had so far. The blood tests are all normal. The full blood count, the urine electrolytes, C-reactive protein, are they all normal? OK, that's reassuring, quite reassuring. Then you, of course, re uh, request an uh, OGD endoscopy. And that shows no significant findings other than some mild gastritis. Gastritis can be due to many, many things, can't it? So other than that, there is um, nothing really significant found. OK, so you started him on omeprazole, which is a proton pump inhibitor, and you discharge him back to the GP. But this is the second appointment. So he has been re-referred by the GP due to ongoing dysphagia. So this is not a good sign, is it? it the symptoms have not res resolved despite your treatment. OK, so what are the differentials, doctor? This is where you pause the video and come back to it in a few seconds after having a think about all the differentials of dysphagia in a patient who is 56 and otherwise fit and well. OK. So I hope you've had a think. So the differentials that I hope you have in your list include uh, a few of these. So the way I have broken broken it down are in the GI system and in the neurological system, and particularly with emphasis on paces. OK, so in the GI gastrointestinal system, first of all, I think about things like esophageal strictures. Esophageal strictures can be benign or malignant. Speaking of malignancies, malignancy is, of course, Cause another one which can cause dysphagia. Malignancies typically happen in the older patients, but it can really happen any uh, any age if you are unfortunate. Um, bear in mind that he is also a smoker, so it, he's at higher risk for a malignancy. But of course, you've done an uh, endoscopy, so that didn't show a malignancy. All right. However, bear in mind not all endoscopies will show a malignancy, even if it is there. Anyway, the other thing you should think about is perhaps a pharyngeal pouch, but he hasn't really had any coughing or regurgitation, so maybe this is less likely. OK, so these are the GI causes that I would be thinking about. Um, malignancy, of course, uh, you know, can happen at any point in the GI system, uh, all the way up to the geodenal system, OK, in the upper GI system, which can potentially manifest as dysphagia, regurgitation, etc. 
Neurological causes, there are plenty of them. If there is any kind of dysfunction, malfunction, impairment of the nerves uh, from the brain to the gut, that can manifest as dysphagia, okay? And that can be uh, a structural deformity or chemical, uh, which we'll talk about in a second, okay? So stroke, of course, is uh, a common one. If a patient has had a stroke, especially a large stroke, then they will be at risk of aspirations because they are not able to have a safe swallow and they have got dysphagia, okay? Multiple sclerosis, especially in the later stages, will manifest as dysphagia. In this patient, we don't really have any other symptoms of multiple sclerosis like numbness, tingling in uh, other parts of the body. So this is less like Motor neuron disease is a very um, unfortunate disease, which is progressive. There are several variants of it, of which amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, ALS, is the commonest one. And that can absolutely cause dysphagia, along with things like bulbar palsy, pseudobulbar palsy. So this is an important one for you to be aware of and have as a, dis a differential, especially in the context of PACES, okay? Another one is myasthenia gravis. Now, myasthenia uh, typically presents with ptosis or eye symptoms, okay, ophthalmoplegia, for instance. Uh, but it can also have dysphagia, especially as it progresses. Lastly, but definitely not the least, malignancy is another one you should be thinking about. Uh, especially intracranial malignancies can manifest as dysphagia as well. Okay, so I hope these are a few things that you thought about. Let's move on then. So you arrange more investigations for Dave and uh, with the hope of finding some clues with these kind of differentials in mind okay so the CT head that you did is unremarkable okay so you proceed to perform an MRI head which is also unremarkable uh, right so this isn't giving us any answers really is it so you proceed to do a lumbar puncture which again is unremarkable so this doesn't look like it is a, um, a you know multiple sclerosis or stroke type picture at all this uh, none of this fits so what do you do on the fourth appointment now, a few months down the line, you still don't have answers and he's still having symptoms. Now, this is not good, is it, doctor? What are you going to do? So you decide to start from scratch. Often in medicine, it is uh, quite possible that you miss something uh, because you go down a certain route. Okay, So it is often better to start from a completely clean slate from scratch okay because that can then allow you to see more okay and uh, reach the right diagnosis in doing so so you he tells you that uh, he recently started noticing pain in the fingers okay so that's new and you examine him and you then notice something that you haven't noticed before what is it you see tight, shiny skin over the fingers on both hands, okay? And also some small white deposits over the digits of the hands, along with the fact that the hands feel quite peripherally cool. Mm. And you notice some telangiectasia on the lips as well, in the inner side of the lower lips. Uh, not necessarily because you looked, but because he showed you uh, and he was worried that this might be some kind of cancer. Okay, so he showed you this. So now you are going to be thinking of something else, aren't you? What is it that you're going to be thinking of? Have a think and come back to this video. If you were thinking of systemic sclerosis, you were along the right lines, Dr. Well done. So this is the case of systemic sclerosis, okay? Systemic sclerosis is a nasty disease, uh, basically. It is quite uh, a horrible disease to have, uh, but it can be well controlled, especially if you are on the right treatment. So let's have a chat about a systemic sclerosis then. You order more investigations. You then suspect a systemic sclerosis. So you do a full autoantibody screen. And of course, the NTSCL70 is positive, which basically, uh, you know, confirms your suspicion of systemic sclerosis. You proceed to do an HRCT, which shows fibrotic changes over the lung basis, and you urgently refer him to the rheumatologist for treatment, as you rightly should. OK, because you're a general medical specialist, this is not your realm anymore. You refer on to the rheumatologist who's going to be caring for him long term. OK, 
So let's go back to Dave for a minute before we talk about systemic sclerosis. So what did Dave have? So he came in with dysphagia, didn't he? What else did he have? So he had CREST syndrome, as it is known as. So CREST stands for calcinosis, Raynaud's phenomenon, esophageal dysmotility. So this is uh, the American spelling for esophagus, okay, with an E, but of course we spell it with an O. So esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly and telangiectasia. So the, this syndrome is actually part of systemic sclerosis, okay? So this is what he's come in with. Um, the key thing that you should be remembering here is that in addition to the GI and the neuro differentials that we talked about earlier, you should also think about rheumatological causes of dysphagia as well. Okay, It is very easy to get uh, sidetracked by systems that we think are relevant but not think of every, all the other systems, which is why often it is important to have like a surgical sieve or, or a systems-wise approach in order to diagnose something or someone so that you don't miss something like this. So what's the management then for systemic sclerosis? So like a lot of rheumatological issues, steroids are definitely one of the mainstays of management. This can be acute or long-term, but often in patients, you will see they are they end up on long-term steroids. Bear in mind though, if patients end up on long-term steroids, then they should definitely have bone protection and GI protection because steroids can cause osteoporosis. So they should be on uh, something like uh, alendronic acid, which is a bis phosphonate, okay, long term, as well as they should be on protein pump inhibitors like omeprazole, lansoprazole, to protect the gut from ulceration or gastritis, uh, okay? So th they will end up on long-term steroids and also immunosuppressants. Immunosuppress immunosuppressants are the mainstay of treatment when it comes to systemic sclerosis. There are a whole bunch of immunosuppressants. You should just be aware of the main ones and their side effects, okay, rather than going into every single one because you are not a rheumatologist. You are going to be training to be a medical registrar. Uh, you're going to be doing medical registrar on calls. When it is relevant, you are going to refer on to the rheumatologist, okay? When the time comes, if you do want to do rheumatology, then you will learn. But for the time being, just remember the main ones. These are things like mycophenolate, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate. So especially, uh, especially for uh, certain ones, like cyclophosphamide, you will often be quizzed about specific side effects, okay? So cyclophosphamide can cause hemorrhagic cystitis. So that's one to remember. Also, methotrexate uh, is, is a very common, but also a very toxic, potentially toxic drug. Uh, it is teratogenic, like most um, bone marrow suppressants are, and uh, this, as I said, it is also a bone marrow suppressant. It is also hepatotoxic and can also cause pulmonary fibrosis. So a few things to remember for methotrexate, okay? Let's talk about Raynaud's phenomenon, which this patient also had. Remember, his hands were peripherally cool. And if you had asked him, so do they get colder? Do they get, do they change color? Then he would have told you that, yes, in fact, they do change color. They become white and blue and then turn red when he comes back indoors into the warmth. And they are painful when they change color as well. So that's Raynaud's phenomenon, okay? So Raynaud's phenomenon can be quite troublesome as a symptom for patients. So they do require require some form of treatment. So conservative measures like mittens can be tried, but often patients may well end up on a treatment like nifedipine. This is very much a, a measure that you should trial for, for patients. In patients who are uh, not responding to treatment treatments like these, then again, stuff like IV prostacyclines and sympathectomy can also be done. Uh, these are not things that you will be um, handling. These are all things that rheumatologists will be looking into and arranging, okay? Just things for you to be aware of and discuss in your discussions and paces, all right? So the key thing that you should be remembering here, in addition to the overall management, is that this is an MDT management, okay? Multidisciplinary team management. This condition requires input from many different specialties and many different disciplines including physiotherapists, respiratory doctors, renal physicians, cardiologists, gastroenterologists, and dietitians. okay? This is a long-term condition requiring long-term input from all these different specialties because this is a systemic condition.
Okay, so respiratory, because they can get pulmonary fibrosis and pulmonary uh, crisis. Um, they can develop restrictive lung diseases. Renal, because they can have renal crises and they can put on, they can put the patients on appropriate renal management. Cardiology, because it's of a similar issue. They can have cardiac failure. Gastroenterology, because they can have uh, bacterial overgrowth and esophageal dysmotility, as mentioned earlier. Dietitians, because they need to optimize their diet so that they can have um, less issues with things like diarrhea, constipation. Okay, so I hope that makes sense, guys. So let's talk about the bite-sized bundle that I promised you at the start of this video. Um, so this, we're going to approach it in the same way that you would approach a PACES case. So we'll talk about the overall demographics first. And in terms of systemic sclerosis, you will find that most patients are younger patients uh, below the age of 60. Okay, so that's how I'm defining younger as. Below the age of 60 typically will be affected. So in their 70s and 80s, you don't really see patients with systemic sclerosis being diagnosed. Okay. Okay, so in the history, this is what you should be asking for. Dysphagia and breathlessness are the two key things, and they are often related. Okay, if a patient comes on with breathlessness and develops dysphagia or vice versa, then you should always be thinking about um, systemic sclerosis. Tightening over the fingers is another clue that you should be asking for in the history. On examination, we start with the hands in paces as always. So we'll start with the hands. On the hands, uh, they will have sclerodactyly, typically. Sclerodactyly is tightening and uh, of the fingers and clawing potentially, as well as calcinosis, which are white uh, calcium deposits in the fingers, okay? In the mouths and lips, we already covered one of them, which is telangiectasia. The other thing that uh, they can have is puckering or microstomia, okay, where the lips come together and they essentially have a smaller oral opening. In the chest, you will hear bibasal and inspiratory crepitations due to interstitial fibrosis. And on the skin, they may well have localized disease, which is more fear. Sometimes patients can just have the skin issue and not much else, okay? And if patients have got the um, skin issue up to the elbow and uh, only involvement of the hands, then that is called limited systemic sclerosis. If it progresses beyond the elbow and goes beyond that and involves other organs, then that is diffuse systemic sclerosis. On the chest x-ray and high-resolution CT scan, you will find bibasal fibrotic changes. And if you were to do a pulmonary function test, then you will find restrictive um, pattern of disease, okay? On the blood test, you can have renal failure, especially in a renal crisis, which is why the renal team have to be involved, as well as you can develop anemia. The key things that you have to remember for bloods are the autoantibodies, which are the anti-centromia, which is for limited systemic sclerosis, and anti-LCL70, okay? Feel free to take a screenshot of this if you want. I hope this is uh, really helpful. If you found this useful, then you make sure you learn more from my book for strategies for high achievers for paces, available in the Kindle format and also in paperback, okay? And also my course, both are linked in the description down below, guys. Do check it out. I'll see you in the next video.